entertained angels without realizing it. Hebrews 13, 2. Hospitality is not to change people, but to give them space where change can take place. Henry Nowen. Listen, my daughter, stay right here with us. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. Ruth, chapter two, verse nine. True hospitality is marked by an open response to the dignity of each and every person. Kathleen Norris. Ubuntu speaks of the very essence of being human. We say, hey, so-and-so has Ubuntu. Then you are generous, you are hospitable, you're friendly, you're caring and compassionate. You share what you have. It is to say, my humanity is caught up, is inextricably bound up in yours. We belong in a bundle of life. We say a person is a person through other persons. Desmond Tutu. And the king will answer them. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Matthew 25, 40. At this table, everyone is welcome. At this table, everyone is seen. At this table, everybody matters. No one falls but me. At this table, you can say whatever. At this table, you can speak your mind. At this table, everything's forgiven. There's enough for everyone. So come as you are, remember that the door is always open, yes, come as you are, the perfect gift that you could bring is your heart. So come, come as you are. At this table, there will be no judgment. At this table, mercy has a seat at this table we're all sons and daughters there's no place i'd rather be so come as you are remember that the door is always open gift that you could bring is your heart. Come, come as you are. Come as you are. At this table, Everyone is welcome. 
At this table, everybody cares. At this table, everybody matters. So come, pull up a chair. Amen. Jody, thank you for sharing your gifts with us. Today we are continuing in our worship series that we have called The Sacred Community, where we are talking about those spiritual qualities and practices that uh, can foster sacred community both within and, and beyond uh, the church. And today we, are, uh, we were scheduled and are scheduled to talk about hospitality, welcoming in. And yesterday, like uh, so many of you, I was monitoring the news out of Colleyville, Texas, and, and Beth Israel uh, Synagogue there, where there was a hostage situation, if you don't know, a, a hostage situation for many hours uh, involving members of that community. Uh, Beth Israel Synagogue is a 12-minute drive from the home that I grew up in in Bedford, Texas. These are the people that I, the community that I grew up around. Um, so it hit a, a special nerve for me personally, but I think it hit a nerve for all of us who belong to a faith community um, because we know that the kind of hatred that struck at Beth Israel can strike in any place. And yet there is a uniqueness to that hatred as well uh, that can strike towards our Jewish siblings and one that we have to be conscious of as Christians uh, living in North Texas, living in America, living in the world today. I think it's important that we offer prayers for those who were held hostage, their family, their friends, their loved ones, for the congregation of Beth Israel, and not just the congregation of Beth Israel, but for all of our Jewish siblings throughout the world who may have woken up feeling less secure today than the day before. I think it's important that we offer prayers for um, the gunman's family and friends who are trying to wrap their minds and hearts around um, processing what it means to uh, see their loved one in, in a very different light, the kind of hatred that grips his spirit. And I think it's important for us to offer more than prayers in a spiritual sense, but in an active sense. And to commit ourselves to being the kind of community of faith to where there are fewer headlines like that. Where the hatred that was uh, witnessed by so many yesterday could be met with a response of hope and faith and love, not just for one body of believers, but for a collective children of God worldwide. And so today we're going to talk about hospitality because I'm not sure that there's a better response for us this morning than to discuss what it means to be committed to the spiritual practice of welcoming in and holding space and creating openness in our hearts, in our minds, in ourselves, and in our communities so that we could come together as one people, ultimately, of God. If you'd like to take that journey with me today, I'd encourage you to offer an amen. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, Weekends like these, the words can fail us. God, would you inspire us to not simply offer prayers in our hearts, but also prayers with our hands and our feet? Would you stir within us a spirit that is prepared to face the injustices of violence and hatred and anti-Semitism and anything else that led to the situation yesterday? And to remember that these kinds of concerns are not limited to one congregation or one people, but they infect us all and affect us all. God, as we consider what is the best thing to do moving forward, could you speak to us through the scriptures and lead us to be a people committed to welcoming in, drawing wide, and opening ourselves up to each other and all that we are until that day when you bind us together as one people of faith, one people of God, until we are realizing that we are all, as Bishop Tutu says, interconnected in an irreversible way. God, would you continue to work on us and lead us in that path? 
our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. And in this text, we're going to witness Jesus at a dinner party, um, something that during COVID time, not all of us are very familiar with anymore, so it might feel like a, a foreign experience. But it's through this dinner party setting that Jesus is going to teach on the subject of hospitality, and more than just in that sort of thinly veiled sentimental sense of having folks over for dinner, but in that serious existential sense that we will come to see. Beginning in verse 7, it says this, When Jesus noticed how the guests sought the best seats at the table, he told them a parable. When someone invites you to a wedding celebration, don't take your seat in the place of honor, he said. Someone more highly regarded than you could have been invited by your host. You might not be the VIP you think you are. The host who invited both of you will come to say to you, give your seat to this other person. Embarrassed, you will take your seat in the least important place. Not a very fun experience, especially when you consider they would sit. It's kind of laying down. So all of a sudden you're like getting your robes back up. Okay, sorry, I'll just come over here. Instead, when you receive an invitation, go and sit in the least important place, Jesus says. When your host approaches you, he will say, friend, move up here to a better seat. And then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. <laughs> But lest we think this is just about dinner parties, Jesus concludes by saying, All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. We're going to stop here for now, but he, he keeps speaking, and we'll see that in a second. This is not simply about dinner party etiquette. I hate to burst that bubble for you. This is not Jesus teaches us cotillion, right? Uh, it's a story that works as a narrative parable, uh, and he'll tell a, a, a more you know, deliberate parable before the evening is over. With Jesus placing us as the central character, he tells it in second person form, which is kind of interesting. You, when you are invited to a wedding feast... Now, Jesus is gathered for a Shabbat meal at a Pharisee's house. Pharisees were religious leaders in Jesus' Jewish tradition in those days. And, and he's gathered there with other religious elders and, and powerful types, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the, and the elders, the, the really important people where he is. And, and Jesus is invited to have dinner for this Shabbat meal, probably because he was growing in renown at this point in Luke's story as a faith healer and a traveling preacher. Right? He's going around the Galilean countryside and building this following, and these Pharisees have learned of him, so they invite him over for dinner, and they invite him to embarrass him, first and foremost. When he arrives, there's this man who's got this growth that has caused him physical pain for years, and nothing has been able to remove it. And so they, they approach Jesus and say, so what are you going to do about this, Jesus? Because it's the Sabbath, and you know. Are you really going to heal someone on the Sabbath? Because that's a big no-no. You can't do work on the Sabbath. And then Jesus does his Jesus thing and offers his comeback where he says, so you're telling me that if your beloved livestock, let's say your, your, your favorite donkey was trapped in a ditch on the Sabbath, you would just say, sorry, donkey, nothing I can do. It's the Sabbath, right? And it's kind of a silly farcical uh, connection that Jesus is making, but he's pointing out like, no, that's absurd. Of course not. And then he heals the man on the spot. Now, you'd think that would be like the big talk of the dinner, right? Have you ever been to a dinner party where someone performed a faith healing before the appetizers were served? Like, you'd think that's what the chapter would be about, but it's not. They quickly move into their musical chairs. It's like they said, oh, that's a neat little parlor trick, Jesus. So where am I sitting? Is it here? Is it here? Right. It's absurd. It's meant to be silly. It's meant to make us laugh. Jesus is talking about where to sit, but he's talking about something deeper. When he comes to the end, there's that existential gut punch. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. The word that Jesus is using there in the Greek that Luke uses is a word that connects to our English word of humility. Humility. Jesus is talking about a deeper character issue, a spiritual issue, and he's spotlighting humility as the spiritual practice that we ought to consider as we seek to be a hospitable, welcoming people, both here at AUMC and in our daily lives. Here's why humility is so important 
as we seek to create sacred communities wherever we go. First, let's talk about what humility is not. First, it's, it's definitely not the way that we hear it talked about in pop culture when someone's handed a great big award that's nice and shiny. It's a lifetime achievement. Everyone's honoring them. And they say, what? I'm so humbled to be receiving this award. That's not what humility is, right? That's what being honored feels like, but it's not what being humbled feels like. Being humbled is being told, you're in the wrong seat. Go sit over there with the peons, right? That's being humbled. It's not that, but it's also not, and this is really important, especially in Christian circles where we will lift up the character of, of humility as an ideal. I want to be clear. Humility is not inviting ourselves to be exploited. It's not doormat theology that says, I don't matter, right? It's not passivity that says, I'm just going to sit back and whatever happens, happens because I'm not important. Jesus is a humble leader who steps into a Shabbat dinner in a Pharisee's home and dresses them all down, right? So you can be humble and assertive. Say amen, somebody. We misunderstand humility to mean simply meek and mild and standing at the wall and, and being a doormat, and, and, and it's nothing of the sort. There's Humility is something of this middle path between that doormat, passivity, exploited, uh, marginalized at times. We're not leading people to be marginalized or exploited. It's a, it's a middle ground between that end of the spectrum and then the elitism and self-superiority with which the Pharisees and the elites carry themselves right? This must be my seat. It's the nice one, right? Humility is something else. Humility from where I'm sitting and where I'm reading this week, it's, it's this spiritual practice that invites openness. It invites openness at our tables, in our conversations, and in the possibility of positive change. At our tables, in our conversations, and in the possibility of positive change. Let me explain what humility looks like to me in the life of a church, for instance. So three years ago, there was this thing called General Conference 2019. And if you don't know what those words mean, God bless you. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's part of our legislative process as the United Methodist Church as a denomination. The short version is this. We gather once every four years. And we try to set laws that work for the whole world. And it turns out trying to set laws at the UN level is not the best idea. I know, it's a shocker. And for the last several quadrenniums, that's, that's an SAT word that means every four years. I had to learn how to spell it. Um, during the last several quadrenniums uh, of gatherings, um, there has been one predominant uh, concern that has faced the global church, and that has been whether or not to include LGBTQ persons in the full life of the church, primarily through ordination and through marriage. And we've been stuck uh, for many, many years. In 2019, we had this special called conference, and we thought it was going to finally break through and finally create a path for inclusion. And instead, what happened was the reverse. We actually ended up with a more punitive legal structure that would punish any pastors or churches, on paper at least, uh, should they break the discipline. That's our fancy language of saying break the rules. And so Arapaho, being who we are and knowing who we are called to be, said we got to do something, right? We can't just offer prayers. we got to pray with our mouths and with our hearts, with our hands and our feet. we got to do something. But what we did was we decided to lead humbly in that process. And rather than jumping to make a, a quick decision that, sure, most people probably would have been on board with, instead, uh, what you did, I'm going to use the, parabola, the parable language of Jesus here because I wasn't here at the time, what you did as the people of Arapaho is say, we're going to step into this with humility and openness at our tables and our conversations and in the possibility of positive change. And so for several months, you engaged in conversations and discernment and prayer together because you had a lot of people who were pretty sure what we needed to do, but you also had a lot of people that weren't sure and were holding questions and wanted to make sure that their concerns could be heard as well, that we were carving a path forward that would unite the church as best as possible. And in the end, a vote was taken to welcome all weddings into the sanctuary where I stand today and, and to to support all candidates for ministry, um, and then to also support pastors of your church who might be punished because of these new rules. Now, that's some actionable change, right? That's putting skin in the game. And the result of that vote, I believe, was somewhere around 95% agreement. Now, if that vote had been taken right after general conference was done, I don't know that we would have had the same sense of unity, but because of that openness and that humility, 
at the tables and the conversations and in the hope for positive change, there was a great sense of unity even in the midst of diversity of our thoughts, our experiences, and our personhoods. Now here I want to be clear. We're a church that, is, that has become clearer about the vision of who we are. And anytime you do that, anytime you become more clear about the vision of who you are, it means that some folks won't align with that vision. And it wasn't a unanimous vote. There were families that left the church over it. And I understand that that's a difficult thing to walk through, but it's important for us to be clear about our vision and to hold that kind of space to walk forward together in a way that we sense God is leading us. And when that vision becomes clearer, sometimes folks don't align. You can't be all things to all people. And Arapaho certainly is not a church that attempts to be all things to all people. Now, I will say, as affirming and as, as, um, as, as much as I want to uplift that experience, and I do, as a pastor watching this happen from afar, like I said, I wasn't here at the time, but I knew what was going on. I was, I'm friends with Blair, and I was praying for you in that process. Um, I think that sense of humility, that spiritual humility that lives here at Arapahoe and leads us to establish justice for one another and for our world. As we step into a clearer vision of who we are and who we are becoming, there's, there's also a challenge for us to retain that humility. Because sometimes when we get more clear about who we are and who we are becoming, it can be easy to begin to see ourselves as self-superior as the Pharisees. And we've got to hold on to that humility that opens not just ourselves, but our tables and our community up to those who may see differently than we do without sacrificing the justice that we hope to establish. Are you tracking with me? Let me put some skin on this. I had a conversation with someone recently, a member of this church, who was expressing to me that they had participated in one of our ministries for many years, and yet were recently trying to decide if they should pause that participation. Because the conversations amongst the folks gathered in that ministry had become, uh, from where they stood, so um, uh, narrowly focused on what is right and what is wrong that they felt like as someone who occasionally disagreed or perhaps had a different point of view, they could no longer voice that for fear of being um, bombarded or, or, or talked down to or, or basically plain told, well, you're just wrong. You need to get where we are, right? And that was, as a pastor, something that I was grateful to hear because what it tells me is that we have a challenge before us to hold on to that sense of humility, to continue to practice that openness that I know is a part of who we are. It has been, and it will continue to be. But that's the tension that we hold as a church that has a clear vision but wants to hold that vision with humility hand in hand. Do you hear me? If that's the kind of church that you want to be a part of, say Amen. Now, it doesn't stop with humility. Humility then leads us into hospitality. Hospitality, serving others without expect, ex, exception or expectation. And this is something that I think AUMC uh, carries in spades. Let's read what, what, what Luke says, Jesus says next. In verse 12, it says, Then Jesus said to the person who invited him, When you host a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you in return, and that will be your reward. Instead, when you give a banquet, invite the poor and the disabled and the blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you. Instead, you will be repaid when the just are resurrected. There's that existential punch at the end that Jesus offers. You'll be repaid when the just are resurrected. So what is Jesus talking about? Here, the second person perspective shifts from us being the, the invitee to us being the host, right? We're switching our roles now. And um, he's challenging us in this extremely natural inclination to want to invite over the people we love and know the best. And also the people that honestly we'd love to get the invite back from, right? So think to yourselves, you know, who are those people in our lives? Like, I don't know, Michael and Dwayne, who have phenomenal homes and the best parties ever. So you're like, I better invite them like at least once this year over to dinner so I can get that Christmas party invite. Thank you for inviting me over, Michael and Dwayne. That's the whole point of this part of the sermon. Anyways. It's not that Jesus is telling us to stop hanging out with the people that we love, but he is challenging us to consider the way that we extend hospitality because the natural way we do is something that I'll call a closed-loop hospitality. 
where we extend hospitality, and by that I mean more than just the sentimental type, the type that costs us something, right? He's talking about welcoming people into our homes that costs us finances, that costs us food, that costs our home, that costs ourselves, that kind of tangible hospitality. The natural inclination is to extend that to the people that we know we love and that honestly part of us knows will reciprocate because that feels good. It feels good to feel loved. This is not something Jesus is saying, stop that entirely. What he is saying is consider. Consider what it looks like to be a people who practice hospitality in the tangible sense with those whom you may never come into contact with again, who may not have the means to bless you in the way that you think you're blessing them. Now, the example used in Scripture here is, and I'm quoting the poor and the disabled and the blind. Let's not get stuck in the transliteration of those words. Those words meant something to the people at the time. These were people in that context who the Pharisees thought had nothing to offer them. They had no home to invite them over to for a fancy dinner. These were people that were just simply below them. And so before we wag our finger at the Pharisees, consider who those people are in your life or in the life that you lead. That if you extend hospitality out, it may never come back. If you extend love and goodness and warmth, if you give of yourself in a tangible, meaningful sense, it may never come back. Jesus says, now that's the heart of hospitality. Because now it's not a closed loop, but it's just being sent out. And Jesus says, what you get in return is quite literally the arrival of the kingdom of God. That's the reward that comes in the end. It's not being invited over for the dinner party next week. It's that God's kingdom is now closer because you are willing to just send it out with no expectation. I think that at AUMC, we are all about love with no exceptions, right? Y'all means all, amen? I think the challenging part for us is to consider how we can be hospitable people, both as a part of this faith community and out wherever God is leading us to live, and to extend that hospitality in a way that simply awaits the kingdom of God's return. Jesus challenges us to serve up hospitality without exception or expectation. And then lastly, there's this uh, scene, I'm going to paraphrase, where uh, Jesus discusses this heavenly feast. In verse 15, it says, When one of the dinner guests heard Jesus' remarks, he said to Jesus, Happy are those who will feast in God's kingdom. Jesus goes on to tell this parable in more of the traditional parable sense. There's a king who wants to hold a feast, and he invites all the important people in his land, those rich elites that love to go to fancy parties. And they begin to send them excuses as to why they can't come, and they're honestly hilarious if you live in first century Israel. They are knee slappers, right? If you were reading it today, it'd be things like, oh, sorry, king, I got to get an oil change that day, actually, so I'm a little tied up, right? It's meant to sound ludicrous. So the king grows frustrated and says, fine, to heck with this invite list. I'm going to invite literally everybody else, right? Literally the rest of the kingdom is invited. I mean the folks that are living on the streets, the folks that are living outside the walls. I want you to go everywhere. Any human being other than these fools is invited to my party. You ever had a party that you did out of spite, right? That's a good party. The only folks that are not ultimately at the table are those who thought they were too good, who wanted the table drawn smaller, who wanted it just a bit more exclusive and fitting their tastes. Those are the only ones who end up missing the party. Here Jesus moves into this new parable and paints a picture of what God is working towards in that wonder for wonder for off here and not yet vision of the kingdom of God that we would like to see return. And it looks like a feast where the overlooked and the outcast and the humbled in life are invited in while the exclusive elites are left on the outside looking in. So there was a pastor that was famous here in the Dallas area back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. His name was Tom, a Methodist pastor. He grew up in Missouri. He grew up in a very poor household. His mother died when he was a child. And back then, a common practice when uh, someone like his dad, who's trying to raise him but doesn't have the funds, a common practice was to basically send his son to go live with a a farming family that would then in turn uh, pay him financially to help him keep his, his own household afloat. So that's what happened to Tom when he was a young boy. He was sent to live with a family in a farming community in in rural Missouri. And this family was led by a, a father who was not a kind person. He made Tom sleep in the barn. 
You know, I can show you pictures of my friends in Missouri this morning. They got five inches of snow. You don't want to sleep in a barn in rural Missouri. They made him eat on the back patio whatever scraps were left over from the family's meal. They would serve to him alone on the back patio. They never invited him to any of the family gatherings, didn't take him to church, certainly not that. He wore whatever hand-me-down, holes-in-the-shoes kind of clothes the family could give up, and, and that was his life for a year. As you can imagine, that was pretty miserable. He wrote his dad, and he said, you've got to get me out of here. This is the worst. And thankfully, his dad took notice and, and, and sent him to a different family the next year. Now, this family was a wildly different experience. They they made him up a room in the, in the family house where he could sleep. And they invited him to share meals with them in the, in the evening. And he had a plate of his own hot, fresh meal right in front of him as he sat at the family table. And the father would take him shopping, and he got a, his first ever pair of new shoes. He was about 10 years old, never had new shoes of his own before. But he had his own shoes for the first time, thanks to that dad. And then one Sunday, they took him to church. They said, we go to church as a family, so you're going to go to church with us. And he did, and he walked in. It was a Methodist church, and it was his first Sunday in church. And you know it was a first Sunday of the month because it was Communion Sunday. We all know that's when the Lord said to have communion, right? <laughs> so it comes time to receive communion and at, the, at the church in this small Missouri farming town that he's living. The church had, had these little altar railings, and the way they practiced communion was folks would come up, and they would kneel at the altar railing, and they would cup their hands and receive the elements of the altar railing. And as he's walking up and he kneels, he kneels down and he looks to his left, and guess who's kneeled there? It's the father of the first house that he lived in. And then the father that he's living with now kneels down on his right side. And as the pastor comes over to hand out the elements, Tom lifts up his hands, and he feels a hand on his wrist clenched tight. It's the father that he'd lived with previously. And he says, no, no. He's frustrated because he doesn't believe that Tom should receive communion. This is his first time in church. What does he know about communion? He doesn't know anything about this place. He doesn't know what it means to be Methodist. What is he doing at this altar railing? And as soon as he feels that one hand on his wrist, he feels another from the man, the father on his right, whom he lived with now. And at first, in a quiet voice, because the man was pretty meek and mild by nature, he was a humble man, but assertive. He said quietly, it's not your table. And he looked at the man on his left, and he said a little bit louder, it's not your table. And then he said as loud as he could, so the whole congregation could hear it, it's not your table. And suddenly, Tom felt both hands leave his wrist. And for the first time in his life, he received communion that day. Now, Tom would go on to become a Methodist pastor, leading one of the largest Methodist churches in the denomination in the mid-century. And he would tell that story to remind every person he ever came into contact with, it's not your table. The feast that we're preparing it's not at our table. The grace of God that he encountered in that moment is the grace of God that we ought to pray encounters the life of every single person in this world. Why? Because it's not our table. And so my friends, as we seek to be hospitable, as we seek to welcome in, let us not pretend that we are playing with trivial things like dinner parties. Fostering sacred community through humility and hospitality invites a heavenly feast, one set at a table that is not our own. May we seek to be the types of people, those who are lived, who live called to sit in the subpar seats, to serve without exception or expectation, and to set a meal knowing it's not our table. Amen. Friends, as we have come to our time of prayer and reflection, I'd like to invite us to remember and recognize um, what tomorrow is. Tomorrow being uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, as we remember the words and the work that he did and that so many others did um, to welcome, truly welcome all people, no matter the color of their skin. 
And I also want us to recognize that today is uh, Human Relations Day, not HR so much in the way that uh, maybe some corporate folks think of, but um, in a way that um, invites us to remember that we are invited to be in relationship with all people, that we are to remember that all people are worthy of dignity and respect and love and care to be seen and heard no matter who they are, where they are from, their background, um, or their current circumstance. And so friends, um, in light of what happened yesterday um, in Colleyville, I also want us to just uh, have that in our hearts. Be mindful of that as we remember um, that we are called into relationship, that we are called to just let it flow from our very being, that hospitality. I had a colleague who shared a, a litany that I thought was a beautiful prayer um, that I would love to share with us this morning. And so let us go to God in prayer. Oh God, hear our cries and send healing and change. Innocent blood cries out from the soil for lives taken because of the color of their skin, their gender, their cultural differences and beliefs. O oh God, hear our cries and send healing and change. We have marched, we have sung, and we have run. We have prayed and watched and waited for a change to come. Loved ones have buried, been buried and leaders have been slain in their prime and families have suffered for the hatred that has plagued our land. We've seen our dreams delayed and fade with the passing of time, hoping and praying that a brighter future would come for our children and our grandchildren. We listened to I Have a Dream speeches. We've chanted with the crowd, yes, we can. We believed in a new day when all would be seen, treated, and accepted. And God, we know that you have heard our cries and that you are sending healing and change. We stand together, black, white, Asian, Native American, Jews, Gentiles, Muslims, churched and unchurched. And together we watch the dream become a reality as we put aside our differences and come together. God has heard our cries and is sending healing and change and unity. Yes, we celebrate this day, our unity and God, our call to be in relationship together. May our differences serve us as a reminder of how precious each and every single one of us is in the human tapestry of life and that the future holds great things for the next generation. Yes, God has heard our cries and is bringing healing and change and unity. And so God, as we uh, remember these words of healing and change and unity, may we remember that this is not our table, that you are the one that invites us to experience uh, this love and this grace and this change, and may we be a part of that work no matter how difficult it may be at times, no matter how heartbreaking it may be at times, may we be a part of that good work. And so now, God, with one voice, unified in your love, may we pray the prayer that you have taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A few things today. First of all, I would like to extend humble gratitude to those of you who noticed that I went to the cleaners this week. <laughs> thank you for thank you for pointing that out to me. I, I really appreciate it and I'll remember it for a while. Two invitations two invitations we have for you this week. The first is that uh, Austin Street Center is uh, expecting our help in delivering breakfast next Sunday. 
Now, it's a little different this time because of the surge in COVID and the Omicron um, virus that, that uh, we are bringing um, the food to the church on Saturday, and then we'll take it down and they will serve it on Sunday morning. You can find information about this on our website at arapahoumc.org slash connect. And you can register there to bring uh, the food that's, that's listed on the website. The second thing is a new uh, gathering that we have that will be led by Aaron Maines, our spiritual director here at Arapaho. Uh, it's called Reconstruct. Reconstruct is an opportunity that will start on January 25th at 7.30. Initially, it will be on Zoom and meeting once a month. The, uh, the goal and the uh, purpose and, and the opportunity for Reconstruct is to bring your questions, to discuss them, to, uh, to follow in your faith journey and understand that we are all on a journey together. So bringing any of your questions and being available to discuss and, and learn from and with each other is uh, what you can expect at that. We hope that we can see you. I'm coming to you from my back patio uh, to talk about generosity. Last week, I uh, introduced Pathways to Generosity. It's our church's approach uh, to the way that we view financial giving as a part of our larger faith. Um, we see generosity as a spiritual discipline and a prayerful act. And all of us during the next few weeks will be praying that common prayer, God, where do you want me to be in my giving? because this isn't about funding a church budget, but it's about growing deeper in our relationship with God. And uh, I'm coming to you from my patio because this is where I've been filming some videos that we call the 21 day gratitude habit. And uh, this is a practice that I'm trying to build into my life of making uh, gratitude and centering on the subject of gratitude, a part of my daily rhythm. I choose the mornings. That's when I've been out here when it's not too terribly cold. Uh, and uh, I've had my uh, third grade Bible with its nifty tabs in there. And I offer a scripture reading, a short reflection. And then I write down a word or a phrase that centers me in my gratitude for that day. For instance, on the first day, I shared that I'm grateful for God's presence in my life. And on the second day, I shared that I'm grateful for the way that God is leading me to live a life of legacy. There's 21 entries on our YouTube channel for 21 days of gratitude. I encourage you to join me in this practice because I think that rooting ourselves in gratitude will help all of us take the faithful next steps down the giving path together. The giving path is a, a visual helpful aid for us as we talk about giving to recognize that no matter where we are in our financial generosity, uh, that we are all able to practice generosity and we are all able to take faithful next steps in that path. Maybe you've never never given before and your next faithful step is to give for the first time. Maybe your next faithful, faithful step is to become a recurring giver and to give on a regular basis. Or, or maybe it's time to give an intentional percentage of your giving. That was a big step for me and my family a few years ago. Or maybe you've decided that it is time to begin practicing a tithe offering 10% uh, back to God for God's work through the church. And uh, maybe you're giving beyond a tithe. I know that we have people in our church that are giving at all levels upon the giving path. And what I love about this process and this season of life in our church is that it invites everyone to participate. Now I have some exciting news on that front because I would never want to invite our church to do something that I and other leaders are not willing to do ourselves. And so um, I'm excited to share that 17 of our ministry and financial leaders at the church that represents a collection of staff who consider this to be their church home like i do um, leadership board members and other ministry and financial leaders 17 households have already submitted early estimates of giving they've participated in the 21 day gratitude journal um, they have prayed the prayer of god where do you want me to be in my giving and they've sent in early estimates as a sign of their desire to take their next faithful step along the giving path. That represents roughly $209,000 um, that is being given to Arapaho over the course of this next year. But that dollar amount is less important than in my mind, the number of households and the sign that it says when they say we're ready to take that next step. As, as leaders here at Arapaho, we are ready to step forward in faith along the giving path. 
And so as you continue to participate in the gratitude journals, as you continue to pray that prayer, God, where do you want me to be in my giving this year? I hope you're encouraged to know that your leaders are out in front and uh, we're inviting you to join us in this process because we believe that God is up to good things here at AUMC in 2022. Now, if you would like to make a gift this Sunday, you can do so in one of three easy ways. You can give online, which is the best and easiest way, quite frankly, at arapahoumc.org slash donate. Uh, and there you can give for the first time or you can set up a recurring gift. You can also give through text to give by texting the word that you see on your screen, Arapaho Give, to the number that you see on your screen. And lastly, you can always uh, send a check to the physical address of our church at the address that you see on your screen now. For all the ways that you give, of your time, your talents, and yourself, I want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to continue in strength and ministry into this year and beyond. Let me tell you, it's so much fun watching yourself on camera. That's the best. Um, it's me again. I know you're tired of seeing my face. Hey, one thing I wanted to mention this week, uh, this is a little bit of internal notification for those who uh, consider AUMC to be your home and have given uh, financially to us in the past. We are beginning to transition this week to a new giving platform called PushPay. And so you'll be getting messages from me in your inbox uh, letting you know about this, but you'll also begin potentially receiving messages from an organization called PushPay uh, that's helping us to migrate over to a new giving platform that is going to be better for our church in the long run. So that's just a heads up. Like I said, you will hear more communication in the future, um, but uh, I hope that you'll join with us in this season as uh, we continue to go into the future with strength. Thank you. And now as beloved children of God, will you please stand and join me in our final hymn, Draw the Circle Wide, number 3154 in your green hymnal, and the words are also found on the screen. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide, draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, we'll stand side by side, draw the circle, draw the circle wide, draw the circle wide, draw it wider still, let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side, draw the circle Please be seated. 
offer you these parting words of peace as we go from this place into the sacred communities that God sends us to. May we go as a people with the spirit of humility, opting for the seat that is less popular to sit in. May we go as a people filled with the spirit of hospitality without exception or expectation. And may we go as a people prepared to set the table for a feast, knowing the table is not our own. Go in peace. Amen.